I'm Spencer Poor. I am a pediatric pulmonologist uh, from University of Alabama um, at Birmingham. This is Nam Su. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most of you know him. I'm kind of the stranger around here, but that's okay. Um, and he's going to kick things off. But like I said, if you want questions or anything, we'll turn the mic. That's perfectly fine. Or ask him through the app. Either way is perfectly fine. Hi, everybody. Oh, you made it. Uh, this is a one of the last ses sessions uh, of this NACFC in-person uh, conference. Uh, welcome to join uh, our workshop, uh, Airway Ions Fluid Mucus Transport. Let's see. We have a, how can I move this? Okay, there we go. So we have five stellar presentations uh, waiting for you, and uh, uh, this is an overly simplified uh, airway, uh, airway surface epithelia, as well as uh, airway uh, some mucosal gland and distal and proximal airway and lumen. Uh, our first speaker, Lockwell Santeo. Uh, Please pardon me, my, my pronunciation is not good. Uh, so, uh, uh, she will discuss about SLC 26A9, uh, the potential role of uh, this molecule uh, in uh, airway pH regulation as well as uh, anion secretion using uh, SLC 26A9 selective uh, inhibitor recently found. And the second speaker is Dr. Wim Shaheen, uh, he's going to discuss about a uh, granular myoepithelial cell that may serve as progenitor cell of uh, granular ionocytes and transcriptional factor LEF1, uh, the role of LEF1 in that process. And the third speaker, Dr. Shoji Luan, he will discuss uh, the effect of hypotonic saline uh, on mucosal clearance, and it includes uh, neuro, neuro, neurogenetic, uh, yeah, neurogenetic uh, component and the role of uh, some mucosal gland secretion in this process. And the fourth speaker, Dr. Alessandra Livraghi, Patrico, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she will discuss about uh, the size of mucin and its impact on mucociliary clearance using uh, transgenic mice. And the fifth speaker, Livia Del Piano, uh, will discuss about uh, the role of TMEM 16A. Uh, in the regulation of ASLPH uh, using cells harboring rare CFTL mutation. So let's uh, start it with the first speaker, Raquel Centeo. Welcome. Thank you for the introduction and also for the invitation to give this talk today. Um, oops. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Raquel Sintayu. I'm a final year PhD candidate. I come from the Kunzelman lab at the University of Regensburg in Germany. And today I'm here to share some of our most recent findings on SLC 26A9. So as most of you in the audience might know, SLC 26A9 is expressed very highly in the lungs, also in other tissues such as the stomach. And it has been shown to work as an uncoupled chloride transporter as well as a bicarbonate and chloride exchanger in different systems. It is constitutively active and has been proposed to contribute to the basal airway chloride conductance as well as potentially the cyclic AMP activated chloride currents in the airways. Um, a mutual physical and regulatory interaction has been shown for SLC 2069 and CFTR. 
and it was recently identified as a gene modifier of the lung function in cystic fibrosis, as well as the response to CFTR modulators, hence why it is currently investigated as a potentially chloride secretory alternative protein to CFTR that when modulated in the airways could compensate for the CFTR dysfunction. And in this work, we made use of a novel, highly potent and selective SLC2689 inhibitor, just recently designed, S9813, to finally then discriminate between the CFTR and the SLC2689 mediated chloride secretion in the airways, and also evaluate other potential functions for this protein in the airways. So we started by immunolocalizing uh, SLC2689 in the airways, and we firstly detected in the airway epithelium uh, staining that seemed to be uh, apical and um, seemed to be present in normal conditions, so non-CF airways, and this staining was lacking in F508 Bell homozygous airways. And this correlates to what has been previously described for SLC2689 interaction with F508 Del CFTR because several reports have shown an, a co-intracellular retention of both uh, proteins, so in the presence of the folding mutant. And when we looked at airway submucosal glands, we saw no staining in any of the conditions. And when we looked closer, and now also co-stained with a ciliated cell-specific marker, so we use here acetylated tubulin in red, we saw in the non-CF airways that this staining seemed to be clearly apical and ciliated cell-specific. Again, we saw no staining in the f 5 l homozygous condition, and in the asthmatic lungs we saw a normal, tentatively maybe, but not clearly enhanced uh, expression of SLC. So our collaborators at the Namkung Lab in South Korea, they made use of this LN215 cell line, which was overexpressing the yellow fluorescent protein YFP and also SLC2689. And they uh, performed a high throughput uh, YFP quenching assay of a large library of compounds. And in this assay, what happens, you can see in the left side, is that the YFP is halide sensitive, which means that when there is cellular uptake of a halide, such as iodide, there is the quenching of the intracellular fluorescence of the YFP. And when these cells are pre-incubated with a compound that has a blocking or an inhibitory effect in general on SLC, we then lose the membrane permeability for iodide and we don't get uh, quenching of the fluorescence. So the results are normal quenching in the presence of a vehicle or inactive compounds and less or no quenching when SLC is inhibited. And after obtaining this first batch of compounds, our collaborators then uh, performed chemical modifications and came up with S9813 which is a compound that is able to dose-dependently inhibit the iodide and cyocyanide uptakes by SLC with a very potent IC50 of 90 and 171 uh, nanomolar, respectively. So then uh, they plan to assess for the specificity of this compound for SLC2689. So they also overexpress in the same cell system other members of the SLC26 family, here A3, A4, and A6, and they also did this with other chloride secretory proteins that are found in the airways, such as CFTR, ANO1, or TMEM16A, and VREC, uh, volume-regulated anion channels. And when these cells were incubated with the S9813 inhibitor, they saw no effect in inhibiting the, the quenching that is mediated by these proteins. And as a confirmatory measure, they then used the specific inhibitors re reported for each of these proteins, and they saw a clear inhibition of the quenching. So supporting the specificity of this compound for A9. And then we moved on to our commonly used cell system, the hex cells, where we overexpressed um, A9, and we found a cytosolic, also membranar staining. And in the mock situation, we had very small basal unsimulated currents that were not sensitive to, to this inhibitor, to increasing concentrations of this inhibitor. And when there was overexpression of SLC2689, now we had larger unsimulated currents that were uh, dose-dependently inhibited by this inhibitor. But this was obtained in an overexpressed condition. And when we moved on to now um, BCI and S1, basal airway cells, that we know to express several endogenous isoforms of A9 and also to show a cytosolic, maybe membranar um, staining of A9, we detected by whole cell patch clamp measurements that the, the currents, the unsimulated currents, are rather small and they are not sensitive to high concentrations of this inhibitor. And we even differentiated these cells in uh, airway liquid interface 
and we saw that um, the immunostaining that we, we detect is able to reproduce what we saw in the native tissue. So the staining seems to be ciliated cell uh, specific and apical mostly. And these uh, filters, they also express other chloride secretory proteins uh, such as CFTR and TMEM16A. And then we measure these filters via Using chamber transepithelial current measurements and we see that the basal currents are rather not affected or very slightly affected by increasing concentrations of this inhibitor. Um, and then by making use of IBMX and Forskolin, uh, here represented as IF, as cyclic AMP enhancers, and CFTR inhibitor 172 as a CFTR-specific inhibitor, we observed that there is mostly a CFTR-dependent uh, basal and cyclic AMP-induced uh, current in this, air, in this airway model, the BCI NS1 cells. We detected more or less the same when we did the, the same experiment now in primary human nasal epithelial cells, also differentiated under ALI. So a slight inhibition by the S9A13 inhibitor and a very strong dependency on CFTR of both the basal and uh, cyclic AMP activated currents, both when the inhibitor, the CFTR inhibitor is applied before or after the S9A13 inhibitor. And then we moved on to a different cell system, a different model completely to try to evaluate the species um, specificity of this mechanism perhaps. And we observed a similar immunolocalization pattern as before, so apical ciliated cell uh, exclusive. And when we measured this mouse trachea in oozing chambers, we also observed that the basal current was again insensitive to increasing concentrations of the SLC2069 inhibitor, while CFTR inhibitor 172 was highly effective already at the concentration of 3 micromolar. And if we look again at the pattern of inhibition of the cyclic AMP currents, we see that CFTR inhibitor strongly inhibits this current, while S9A13 does not uh, touch it. So this was supporting that CFTR is really the responsible channel for both the basal and the cyclic AMP activated currents in the airways, both human and mouse airways. So then we, we started this other part of the project very recently. We have just preliminary experiments. We plan to assess other potential functions for SLC 2689 in the airways, given that we cannot detect a chloride secretion that is mediated by SLC, endogenous SLC. So we use the system. Um, here uh, I have represented a, the, the cell lines used before, now expressing SLC 26A3 and A4, which are known for their constitutive chloride bicarbonate exchanger function. And in this system, what happens is that we make use of a chloride-rich extracellular solution, so we are able to force the transport in a direction that is chloride absorptive and bicarbonate secretory, and we confirm their, their exchanger function by uh, seeing that there is a decrease of the intracellular BCCF fluorescence. And BCCF is a pH-sensitive dye, and this indicates that there is a bicarbonate depletion of the intracellular media and therefore acidification. And surprisingly, we did not observe this for A9. So when it is individually overexpressed in this cell system, it does not seem to have a constitutive um, exchanger function. However, when we assess the ASL pH in primary human nasal epithelial cultures, the same that we used before for the Wussing experiments, we observed that by uh, incubating them with the S9813 inhibitor, so the red line, they, this resulted in an overtime uh, acidification of the ASL. And we were thinking of, that this might show that SLC269 is in fact secreting bicarbonate in, in these cells, and this might be mediated um, via a recycling of the CFTR uh, secreted chloride, which has been demonstrated or proposed for, SLC, for CFTR and other members of the SLC26 family in different tissues. Uh, however, I, I mentioned in the beginning that these are just very preliminary experiments, and for example, in the cyclic AMP simulated situation, we have uh, unclear results, so we seem to have a tendency, although insignificant, to a real colonization when we have inhibition of SLC and um, no effect in the control condition, which is of course something that we need to further delve into and try to explain. And finally, I'm just showing this as a confirmatory measure that this inhibitor seems to be in fact acting on endogenous SLC because this could be the problem here. Uh, we made use of the gastric parietal cell system 
where SLC has been previously reported to have a chloride secretory function. Uh, and this chloride secreted by SLC was uh, proposed to work as a counter ion for the proton secretion and allow for gastric acid production uh, and secretion in the stomach. And so our collaborators made use of this HGT1 human gastric parietal cell system and they measured the histamine mediated uh, proton release. And when they pre-incubated with the S9813 inhibitor, we in fact uh, observed a uh, inhibition of the proton secretion. And this was also evident uh, in co-incubation with the inhibitor at high concentrations of, of the drug. So in summary, our conclusions are that the expression of SLC26A9 seems to be limited to ciliated epithelial cells in both human and mouse airways and seems to localize mostly to the apical membrane. Uh, it does not seem to be in charge of either the basal or the cyclic AMP stimulated chloride secretion in either human or mouse airways, rather CFTR seems to be the most uh, important channel for this function. We hypothesize that maybe depending on the CFTR expression and the particular cellular context and other protein partners, uh, SLC may change its operating mode, may work as either a chloride transporter or as an exchanger. And we show here some preliminary evidence that it does seem to contribute to the alkalinization of the airway surface liquid. I want to acknowledge my colleagues, of course, at the Consulment Lab for contributing to this work. Also, our collaborators at the Namkung Lab in South Korea, because they were the ones developing this inhibitor. Collaborators at the Gray Lab at Newcastle University and also the Somoza Lab in Munich, in Germany, uh, for collaborating also with contributing with experiments and their expertise. I want to personally acknowledge uh, professors Eric Verbecken, Chris de Boek, Roland Crystal, and Jeff Beekman for providing the lung sections that we use for the immunostainings, also the BCI and S1 cell line, as well as the human primary cells. And a word of acknowledgement also goes to the funding sources that made this research possible. So we are supported by the UK Cystic Fibrosis Trust, by the DFG, the German Research Foundation, and also the Gilead Foundation. And thank you for your attention. Any questions? Yeah. Inciliated cells. Yeah. Uh, what I've seen mostly is that they propose expression of SLC twenty sixty nine in the alveolar cells, uh, epithelial cells type two, I believe, and um, it's not ciliated cells specifically from the reports that I've seen uh, before in terms of RNA expression. via CFTR. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I, th I believe this could still be in place, no, when they are both expressed together. But it's still unclear the effect on, I believe, SLC 2069 function, um, the co-expression with CFTR, some groups propose that the function is enhanced, some groups propose that it is inhibited. But in terms of CFTR, we do believe that there is, uh, if it's mediating as proposed for other SLC26 proteins, this recycling of the chloride via CFTR, it could be in fact stimulating CFTR function. Should be, sorry? Yes. Yes. And then the problem, what you're Mentioning I'm, it's perhaps that CFTR is not expressed in ciliated cells or... Yeah, this, this, of course, this of course is the million dollar question. I was not expecting to escape this one. <laughs> uh, no, uh, so honestly, from what we clearly, I think we are clearly all going into this consensus where CFTR is mostly expressed in secretory cells and not ciliated cells and ionocytes, uh, obviously. 
but we, there is still some RNA detected in ciliated cells. And for us, because we've discussed this in the lab, of course, this question came up, um, it is really difficult to, to conciliate the complete lack of CFTR expression in ciliated cells with the fact that we do observe the intracellular retention of uh, SLC when there is a 508 del CFTR expression, which also your lab has, has shown, several labs. And we, in the stainings particularly, our first thought when we observed this uh, clear apical staining in the non-CF condition, the first thought was, well, maybe this is working as has been proposed for the CFTR antibodies as before. It's detecting the cilia and not exactly SLC in the membrane. But the F508L condition is clearly showing no staining of SLC, and this is difficult to explain if there is no CFTR expressed in this uh, in ciliated cells. Yeah. Have I ever tried to knock out SLC twenty sixty nine and what? Sorry. No, we did not um, make any knockouts uh, so far. Um, yeah, not of SLC, definitely. One thing that I would also like to measure, maybe to get some ideas from the audience, is that um, we have observed that when we have a complete CFTR knockout, when we saw this in uh, piglet tissue, so not, not, not other tissue, uh, that we do have a normal uh, apical expression of SLC. So there is intracellular retention when there it is co-expressed with f 508 lcftr but when there is a complete knockdown, knockout of CFTR, SLC seems to traffic normally to the, to the membrane. And this might show, other groups have reported that this um, interaction be between CFTR and SLC um, is happening when there is wild-type CFTR, and then it's also happening when there is f 508 lcftr and it, the intercellular retention is enhanced because the interaction with this PDZ protein that allows for intracellular retention is enhanced by this uh, interaction. But um, in the complete absence of CFTR, it's not clear how SLC is trafficking to the membrane, and we have observed in piglet tissue that it might just traffic normally. So this could be potentially uh, an option for stimulation in the case where we don't have CFTR at all. Okay, last question. Oh, I got it. <laughs> when you measure pH, so the pH is typically a cell that bends some pH. So, how do you do that? So, what's the CO2 content? Where is? The CO2 content of air on top of the cell membrane. I, uh, we have our, no, <laughs> yeah, maybe I can ask you. Uh, I'm not a pH expert, honestly, but we, our chambers are incubated with 5% uh, CO2, uh, I believe, and we do this in um, plate readers, so very consistently conditioned, consistent conditions. Thank you. Thank Great you. job. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you all. So next up, we have Dr. Shaheen. He's going to talk about LEF1 induces FOXL1 dependent ionocyte specification from submuglosal gland progenitors. All right. Thanks for the co chairs for extending an invitation to me and also um, for the introduction. So I'm William Shaheen. I work at the University of Iowa with John Engelhardt. And we, uh, <clears throat> we are basically interested in myoepithelial cells as submucosal gland and submucosal glands of airways as stem cells and how these cells can differentiate into ionocytes and the, door, the, the, the role of LEF1 in this process. And I have nothing to disclose. So um, pulmonary ionocytes are rare airway epithelial cells that express a unique set of... Um, of ion channels. This unique set of ion channels will um, actually, this unique set of ion channels uh, qualify these cells for a great role in um, ion transport and thus in uh, airway, surface, liquid, and mucus balance. Um, however, the, um, 
origin of ionocytes is not well or is not very clear. On the other hand, um, um, the, uh, so the um, lineage tracing experiments have shown that submucosal gland, airway submucosal gland myopithelial cells um, are reserve stem cell. After injury, these cells are mobilized and give rise to at least seven cell types that will uh, populate the submucosal glands, their ducts, as well as the surface airway epithelium. Um, more, so multiple types of these cells are actually CFTR expressing, and we want to know if these cells actually can give rise to ionocytes as well. The interesting finding comes from the fact that both ionocytes and submucosal gland myopithelial cells share the same distribution ac across species. While you can find them only or restri restricted to the proximal trachea in mice, you can find them actually uh, throughout the whole uh, cartilaginous airways in human, ferret, and pigs. This is interesting. This led us to hypothesize that there might be a lineage relationship that between glandular myoepithelial cells and pulmonary ionocytes. More interestingly, LEF1 overexpression or ectopic LEF1 expression in myoepithelial cells can mobilize these cells without injury to give rise to the same seven cell types or more that we just talked about. So the same, the, these, both cell of the cells share the same distribution and at the same time, LEF1 overexpression will mobilize one of these cells to give rise to the seven types we, look, we talked about. And at the same time, the single cell RNA sequencing um, studies have shown that uh, ionocytes have the highest expression of LEF1 among all airway epithelial cells. So we hypothesized, after all of that, we hypothesized that probably LEF1 overexpression will promote ionocyte differentiation by myoepithelial cells of submucosal glands. To tackle this question, we went ahead and did some lineage tracing experiments. To do the lineage tracing experiments, we used um, two, actually not one, um, um, Cree driver. It's like smooth muscle myosin, heavy chain Cree ERT2, as well as alpha SMA, alpha smooth muscle actin um, Cree ERT2 driver. Both of these Cree drivers will express Cree ERT2 only in myoepithelial cells, but not in any other airway epithelial cells. So these mice are actually expressing at the same time either Rosa TG, um, Cree, Cree, Cree reporter, or the left one conditional knock and construct. In this case, when we treat with um, tamoxifen, the wild type mice or Rosa TG myoepithelial cells and the Rosa TG mice will convert from tomato positive into GFP positive, while in the left one knock and, knock and conditional knock and mice, the myoepithelial cells will turn the, the GFP off and will overexpress left one. We then prepared um, SMG cells from these mice and facts sorted for myoepithelial cells, either GFP positive in the wild type side or left one, the colorless cells in the left one overexpressing, and then we plated them in ALI cultures. All right, we have overexpressed left one and myoepithelial cells and cultured them. So what will happen to the short circuit current? Interestingly, in both models or both Cree drivers, we have seen a significant increase in CFTR-dependent short circuit current and chloride transport in both of these cells after left one except overexpression. And the delta was quantified and it, it seems very significant. And the same trend was seen in bicarbonate, um, bicarbonate, bicarbonate transport, except at a little lower magnitude, but still significant. All right, what about the um, ionocyte differentiation? To tackle that, we, did, we, stay, we used immunofluorescence to stand for two markers for ionocytes, BSND and FOXI1, BSD in red and FOXI1 in white. Uh, in, in white. And as you can see, with left one overexpression in both of the Cree drivers we used, left one overexpression in myopithelial cells resulted in significant increase in the percentage of ionocytes in both uh, these of the Cree drivers. So this was quantified, and it was basically no, uh, phenomenal. We found a significant increase, and it was very um, consistent. We repeated this experiment multiple times. 
And we have seen both the double positives and the, the single positives, whether it's FOXI1 positive BSND negative or BSND positive FOXI1 negative cells. All right, we wanted to confirm these results. We did qPCR for the BSND, FOXI1, as well as the CFTR in these cells. Interestingly, the three of them were upregulated in both of the uh, models we used. <clears throat> All right, we have seen that left one overexpression in myopathial cells were increased ionocyte formation in vitro. What about in vivo? So we, to do that, we did use the same um, models we just talked about. And instead of preparing the cells, we just wait for another 35 days after induction and um, uh, did a whole mount stain for uh, the whole mouse tracheas. We did that because of the rarity of ionocytes. If you do sections, it will be very hard for you to find any. We have tried that. And then um, we stained for BSND as a marker for ionocytes. And here's what you are looking at is a single 63x, uh, um, 63x field of view. And uh, this is a very thick z stack throughout the whole mouse trachea. And what I'm showing here is the upper one is a, an XY level at the level of surface airway. And the lower, the second XY level is at the level of submucosal glands. As you can see, HBS and D in magenta uh, is way more. We can see more cells that are labeled in, in, in magenta and the left one of expressing tracheas um, compared to the wild type ones, both on the surface as well as in the um, and the submucosal gland level. We, said we quantified these cells both, again, on the surface and in the submucosal glands, and we can see the same significant difference or increase after LIF1 over overexpression in myoepithelial cells. And interestingly, this increase in ionocyte formation was mostly accounted for by the myoepithelial cell lineage. All right. In the summary for what I have seen, I have, what I have shown so far is that LIF1 enhances chloride and bicarbonate conductance by myoepithelial cell-derived ALIs. LIF1 promotes ionocyte differentiation by glandular myoepithelial cells in vitro as well as in vivo. And myoepithelial cell, myoepithelial cell lineage accounts for most of the increase we see in airway ionocytes. All right, we had another question. So are ionocytes responsible for that augmented ion transport that we saw with LIF1 overexpression in myoepithelial cells? There is clear association or clear correlation, but is there a cause-result relationship here? So to tackle that, we went ahead and overexpressed LIF1 in myoepithelial cells, and at the same time, we prevented ionocyte differentiation. As, has been as was shown by multiple studies from J.R. Jagobal, um, lab and others, that FOXI1 is a master regulator of ionocyte differentiation and specification. So we went ahead and overexpressed LIF1 and um, knocked out FOXI1. To do that, we used CRISPR-Cas9 model. We have these mice that, are, that have H, that express um, Cas9 in H3 and H11 locus, and at the same time, they have the left one conditional knock and cassette at the rows of 26 locus. So we, we prepared the myope myopathelial cells from these mice and treated or transfected LOX B plus or minus FOX I1 guide RNAs. <coughs> this means that um, LOX B guide RNA will result in loss of color in, in these cells. So it's, they will be GFP negative, and then we fax sorted for GFP negative cells and cultured again in ALIs. To make sure that we knocked out ionocytes, after differentiation, we went ahead and measured the levels of ionocyte markers using qPCR. With qPCR, we see, yes, there is a significant increase in these three markers, CFTR, BSND, and FOXI1 after overexpression of LEF1. But interestingly, FOXI1 knockout took all of these down. All right. So what about ionocyte differentiation? Do we, we wanted to make sure that this is the case at the protein level. So we did staining for the three markers this time, CFTR, BSND, and FOXI1 and white. And interestingly, the same results are repeated. With LIF1 overexpression, we can see a significant increase in the treble positive cells that have 
BSND, Fox I1, and CFTR as well. And this increase actually goes away with Fox I1 knockout. All right, now to the big question. Now we, we knocked out or prevented ionocyte differentiation. How will that affect the short circuit current that we saw earlier? We did the short circuit current and interestingly, yes, LIF1 overexpression augmented the, sh the chloride transport, but LIF Fox I1 knockout took all of that augmented all the way down even lower, to, lower than the wild type level. And this was significantly um, different. So with that, I'd like to conclude that, well, LIF1 enhances chloride and bicarbonate conductance by myopathial cell-derived ALIs. This is correlated with ionocyte differentiation by these cells, and this improved ionocyte or um, um, this improved ion transport actually is ionocyte dependent and induction of ionocyte specification by LIF1 overexpression in myopathial cells might help restore airway surface liquid and mucus balance in CF patients and CF, uh, on CFTR modulators. Um, for future directions, we would like to, <clears throat> sorry, um, we'd like to define the GMAC or myopathial cell progenitors, the progeny of myopathial cells that will go ahead and make ionocytes at the end. With that, we'd like to do multiple uh, single cell RNA sequencing at different developmental stages. And we wanted to dissect the mediators of LIF1 induction that will make ionocytes. And also would like to study the consequences of LIF1 overexpression in um, animal models of diseases. With that, I'd like to thank um, all the members of Chuck Yeman's lab and John Englehart lab in Iowa, and also all of you and the CFTR Foundation for funding and for giving us the opportunity for the whole, um, for the whole event. <laughs> And the co-chairs, thank you all. Okay, questions. So um, we, um, so what do you mean exactly by other ion channels? So, so for, for ENAC it was, it was intact. So here you can look at ENAC here with amyloride, amyloride dip inhibition, it, it went down in most of them. But because of the low currents here, it went down. But also the TER, transepithelial resistance was, um, was comparable to in, in the four groups here in this experiment. Yeah. Um, we do have a, question in the chat. Would it be useful to co-deliver CFTR gene and LEF1 gene for gene therapy application? Oh, that's a great question because it, it will, uh, will, like, so both of them are, will work differently. So while LEF1 overexpression will promote ionocyte formation, which has a lot of CFTR, adding CFTR to the, to the equation will do something that's different. So it depends on which cell type are you planning to overexpress CFTR in, because we are here talking about myopathelial cells. So if you express it like in, in, in uh, secretory cells, yes, this might have an augmenting effect. Yeah, you're looking at me like I asked the question, but I didn't <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm answering. Just kidding, sorry, I'm, sorry, kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. kidding. I'm kidding. Right. I'm kidding. Everyone, okay. go ahead. Right. Yes, in the blue. Yeah. Really? Um, any changes in the uh, and excuse me? So we didn't, we didn't study that yet, but we have the tools to do that. Yes, um, we, we are planning to do the same thing. Yes. Yep, yep. So I think that's a great challenge. Um, any indication of the turnover of ionocytes if there's any trace of the wild types within 30 days where the majority of ionocytes changes on lineage trace or just a select few? Most of them are lineage traced. So you have a high proportion of turnover within 30 days? Um, so um, basically, remember that we overexpressed left one only in this 30 days, not before. Even with the wild type tissue. And the wild type tissue, it didn't change at all. But we have like 50-50 of, um, of both of them. I think I have that somewhere. Yep. This one. Yep. So it's basically, it's, it's less than 50% actually in the um, myopathial cell-derived ones. Yeah. Right. 
Right. Have you, they're very rare in these episodes. Have you thought of adopting one of those? Like, to, to not get that one to see if absence of ion side effects in vivo is a good Yes, we, we thought of that. Left one, knockouts, right? We are talking about, we looked at that in, 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 in vitro. Yes, because um, left, one, um, left one knockout is, is quite problematic. These cells do not grow well within the absence of left one, even though it's not, easily, it's not easy to detect that with aluminum fluorescence. But still, it is problematic. The cells, once you knock out left one, the cells start growing very poorly and start dying. So we have a conditional knockout. And we try that. And definitely, there is less ionocytes. And the um, short circuit current went down way below the uh, wild type. Yep, we did that. I have a quick question. Go ahead, sir. Um, knowing where you work um, and things, and going back to your picture where you were describing the differences between the mice and others, have you considered kind of piggybacking a little bit there? Are you looking at going into other models to look at this in a little bit more detail? Definitely. Yeah. I, I want, I, that was a kind I of a low-hanging fruit I, question. I, I, I want to use ferret model for that. <laughs> I and figured I, that's I, where I this been, was going. That's why I, I wanted to I have ask. been pushing John to make a, a left one look and ferret model to look for that. Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And actually, one of my aims or, or future directions is to study the effect of left one overexpression in animal models for of other diseases, and I'm really interested in larger animal models. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so you can get mild glial cell uh, derived surface area of the from either overexpressing left one. Yes. All right, so, so, so we basically, the experiment here is to induce left one of expression, right? And then wait for like 30 days or more, and then um, uh, isolate surface area epithelial cells as well as myoepithelial cells and look for the ionocyte formation of that. I didn't, I didn't do this exact experiment, but what I did is I isolated both cell types and overexpressed left one, which is different definitely than your question. And it's a different biology result. Uh, you believe me, it's, it's different. And I, yeah, it's, it's different. So the, 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 the reaction of um, basal cells to left one over expression was totally different than what we see with myopathial cells here. Yep. Last one. Yeah, basically, they, they are working with, with um, basal cells mostly, not with myopathial cells, which is different biology, as I said earlier. This is one. The second thing I'm doing, um, I'm doing CRISPR-Cas9, which is like you just um, take the cells by surprise of knocking that out and then see what, how they will differentiate. Yeah. Go ahead. So I didn't do that yet. But I'm planning to do that with the um, by with collaboration with the third guys in the lab. Yeah, maybe you. <laughs> maybe you. <laughs> <laughs> that was a plug. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So much. Okay. Thank y'all. Next up, we have Dr. Luan. He's going to talk about inhibiting the neurogenic component of, it seems like it cut off one, sorry. I know what it says. There we go. But the response to hypertonic saline treatment increases mucociliary clearance in CFs. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer and the chairs for inviting me for this presentation here. So I'm a postdoc fellow in University of Saskatchewan. And I'm an inventor of a pending pattern related to this topic. And there are no other financial relationships to disclose. 
So as everyone know, hypertonic saline treatment is a well-used treatment for CF patient. And hypertonic saline correct the airway dehydration in the CF patient, which further improve the airway mucosal clearance process. The current prevalent understanding is that the hypertonic saline uh, rehydrate the airway because of the osmotic effect from the treatment. However, it has been suggested that the other mechanism of action of hypertonic saline may be involved in this process. Recently, we published paper, and uh, in that paper, our data suggests that actually hypertonic saline stimulate the local airway neurons, and those airway neurons further stimulate the submucosal gland secretion there. And this neuron-mediated uh, submucosal gland secretion may count as much as 50% of hypertonic saline-triggered airway hydration effect. Here, we want to test uh, the rule of airway nervous system in hypertonic saline treatment response in the CF airways. So the trachea we used in our experiment is, were isolated from wild type uh, or, and got corrected CFTR knockout a swine with you one week after birth. And we used those trigger for our experiment uh, within six hour, uh, within six hour uh, uh, of euthanization. The preparation of our trachea was treated with 90 seconds nebulization of hypertonic saline or isotonic saline. And for our experiments, the cirrhosal side of the trachea was immersed in the Krebs ringer solution. And in order to improve access of our blockers, we actually removed the cartilage from the trachea. And for the apical side of our preparation, the fluid in the trachea lumen was only produced by the tissue. So we didn't add extra fluid on top of the airway surface. And we use a mucocellular clearance assay to study the MCC process. And we use a synchrotron-based uh, imaging technique to monitor how hypertonic saline affect the airway hydration. So for our mucocellular clearance assay, we cut a piece of the peak trachea, and we cut it open through the smooth muscle at the opening of C-shaped cartilage and we pin down the tissue in a dish. And it's the cirrhosal side of the trachea is immersed in the warm Krebs ringer solution. And we put the dish into a custom built chamber, which uh, filled with hum humidified 95% uh, oxygen, 5% CO2. And we put uh, titanium discs on top of the airway surface. Uh, and we can monitor the movement of those discs, uh, which this method is used by University of Iowa. And as you can see here, because we cut a piece of the trachea, there's an edge effect in our environment. So the mucus clear to the edge of uh, our preparation, and those dish always move from the lower trachea to the upper trachea toward the lowerings. And so we set a parameter of uh, measurement to set, set a threshold of our measurement, set is a successful clearance. Also, we measure how fast those particles move. So for the synchrotron-based face contrast imaging method, we used to monitor the height of liquid layer. Um, so our preparation is intact and put into a custom-built chamber. And the whole trachea is immersed in the Krebs-Ringer solution. But the, the lumen of the trachea is filled with air. So the synchrotron generates a coherent single wavelength X-ray. When the X-ray pass through our trachea preparation, because of the refractive index difference between air and the airway surface liquid, and this refractive index difference causes the shift of the X-ray. And this X shift of X-ray highlights the airway surface liquid and air interface. And this shifting can be detected by the X-ray detector there. And this is an image we got from our experiments. 
the lighter part is the lumen of the airway, and the darker part is the tissue and the liquid layer. And this dark line is the airway surface liquid air interface. And we use an agrospeed loaded with barium sulfate as a tool to measure the height of a liquid layer there. So first, uh, we're wondering what happens if we block the iris neurons. So on the left is the liquid layer height we measured in the isolated trachea experiments in wild-type trachea. And on the right is the delta liquid layer change, which means we compare the liquid layer height and compared it to the first point of liquid layer height before hypertonic saline nebulization at time zero. So as you can see here, compared to isotonic saline, hypertonic saline stimulates uh, liquid layer increase in the uh, wild-type swine trachea. However, if we block the airway neuron with lidocaine and tetratoxin, TTX, actually it's a reduced the hypertonic saline triggered uh, airway hydration effect in the wild-type trachea. And then we use our mucociliary clearance assay to study the mucus MCC process. So as you can see uh, on the left is uh, how many particles are moving uh, clear uh, by the MCC process. And uh, on the right is the speed of those moving particles. So as you can see compared to isotonic saline, hypertonic saline significantly increase how many particles that's successfully cleared from the airway. And also, it, the speed of those movements is uh, almost doubled compared to isotonic saline. However, when we apply TTX to our preparation, it's reduced the amount of particle that's successfully cleared from the airway. Although the speed of the movement is not significantly different, it, there's a reduce there. Then we try our blocking, uh, try the effect of blocking airway neuron in the CF swine trachea. So we did the same thing. We nebulized hypertonic saline treatment. You can see there's an increase of liquid layer after hypertonic saline treatment. However, this treatment can be blocked by lidocaine, TTX, and atropine when we add them into the surrounding surrounding saline. So we see a reduction of airway hydration uh, in the CF swine trachea uh, after hypertonic saline treatment. So we expect uh, there's a reduced MCC process. However, our results surprise us. We, after, when we add TTX into the saline surround the trachea, actually it improved the hypertonic saline effect for the how many particles that successfully cleared from the airway, it also increased the speed of those particles move. And it's totally different from the wild type swine, swine result. So we're wondering how. So what we do is we investigate what happens if we block the CFTR channel in the wild type swine trachea. So we use CFTR inhibitor 162. We incubate that with wild type swine trachea for a half hour, and we do our experiments. And as you can see here, when we block the airway neurons with lidocaine TTX, it's reduced the hypertonic saline triggered airway hydration effect in those CFTR blocked swine airway. However, uh, the mucosilic clearance process is there's no change after we put tetratoxin there. So blocking the airway neuron didn't block, uh, didn't affect the mucosilic clearance process in the CFTR block that wild type swine trachea. So the how many particle that's successfully cleared and the speed of those movement didn't change after that. So this result indicates that simply block CFTR channel not, was not sufficient enough to recreate a CF phenotype. So in conclusion, the airway nervous system is involved in the hypertonic saline triggered airway hydration through a gland secretion in both wild type and CF swine trachea. 
and blocking the gland secretion improve MCC process in the self swine trachea. In contrast, in the wild type swine trachea, blocking gland secretion reduce MCC process. Our result is consistent with its recent report that gland secretion are abnormal and fail to detach from gland in the self airway, which actually the abnormal and very thick, very viscous mucus cause this impaired MCC process. So we think blocking hypertonic ceiling triggered gland secretion in self would still promote osmotic drive airway hydration from hypertonic ceiling while inhibiting, uh, inhibiting the production of those abnormal mucus uh, that diminish the MCC process. Finally, I would like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Julian Tan, and Professor Juan Anoski for their support, and lab member in our lab, and doc, uh, Professor Kapnuzi for letting me understand more about how neurons work, and uh, what in, the vet, in our vet college helping us to take care of the, those CF uh, piglet, which is not an easy job to do, and uh, our vet help us doing uh, life, uh, taking care of uh, animals while we do our experiments, and Canadian Light Source Beam at Beamline. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Uh, you go first, blue shirt, and then blazer. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a good question. We haven't tested it yet. That's definitely a drug that we can test. Yeah, we should test. Oh, that's a really good question. So what our technique is, uh, actually, we usually, the liquid layer we usually measure is about 90 micrometer height. And uh, our detector is sensitive and the uh, pixel size is small enough to pick up very small change. And for the DTX question, um, we didn't, uh, Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's probably come from the osmotic effect from HTS alone. So there's a salt there, the driving force of osmotic pressure is there. So there's still increase in the cell area, even there's no secretion now from the gland. Uh, yeah, because of the limitation of uh, the self tissue, so we can only choose certain experiments we can measure, so we didn't actually measure. Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. That, uh, yeah, uh, TTX is a nasty blocker. So, but uh, the main conclusion is that in self, there's a different, and and when we block CFTR in wild type, it didn't like uh, recreate the same condition. So we think that must uh, the gland secretion, the mucus that secrete from the gland must contribute this. I have, I have a question for yeah. you. Um, so clinically, we use 
I'm a pediatrician, so in the babies we go 3% often, but then we go to 7%, and even up in severe situations where we need to get a lot of mucus, where we want to get a lot out, we use up to 10% hypertonic saline. Have you looked at any dose response in that sense to how this is responding in things? Uh, no, I no, okay. didn't look for it. The we one, just use uh, really yeah. high concentration to see whether there's a difference. Because to be clinically relevant with it, that would be something to be interesting. And the other part I would ask, when it comes to hypertonic saline treatment, when you're looking at lidocaine and um, reducing any neuronal uh, mm -hmm. signaling, one of the key features of treatment with hypertonic saline is actually the initiation of a cough, okay, mm -hmm. which is driven by those receptors. So you hydrate that area, but mm -hmm. you want to mobilize it. So if you inhibit it too much, you can bring the water and the mucus and everything, you may thin it, but if you're not able to expectorate it, you that's a very key component to that treatment. So just something to think of when you're moving yeah, forward. Yeah, maybe we can only limit it to the blocking effect for the local airway neuron, not yeah. the... Like just, just for example, yeah. when we perform bronchoscopy on people, we apply lidocaine to their vocal cords and carina so they will not cough during the procedure. Yeah. And that is so we can complete it and they won't have a full bronchospasm while we're in the airway. Yeah, it's a good point. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, we'll go to the next one. Okay. Our next speaker is Alessandra. I'm going to mess your last name. It's cool. Okay, I'm just going to go with Alessandra. There we go. Uh, why are mucins so gigantic, and is it rational to sever them to aid in mucus clearance? Yep. So thank you for the organizer and thank you all for being here in this last stretch of the uh, CF conference. Um, what we're going to try to address today is an existential question in uh, the field of mucus biology. Why are muc mu mucins so big and is it rational to cut them to help mucus clearance? So as you can see from the impressive list of authors in this paper, and from our funding agency, this has been a truly multidisciplinary effort. And I'm going to try to highlight the different contributions as I go through the data. I don't have any, anything to disclose. Um, so our group has a long-standing interest in understanding the mechanism of mucus clearance, which is how do we get these bits and pieces of mucus out of the conducting airways? As many things in life, the more you know about the issue, the more um, equipped you are to deal with it. So one of the things that we know about mucus and mucins is that many of the biophysical properties of mucus depend on the size of their major macromolecular component, which are mucins. This concept has been uh, documented with uh, very solid experimental and theoretical data that you can find all together summarized and broken down for a non aficionados like me in that wonderful review that has just come out in the literature. So because I'm advertising their paper, I feel totally fine in stealing a figure from this, from this review to help me explain you the rationale of this project. So here in this row, uh, we can see the mucin um, as depicted as this like squiggly green line, and each of them is characterized by a radius of duration, which is directly proportional to their size. So big radius of duration, big mucins, little radius of duration, little mucins. So depending on the concentration of mucins, mucus can exist in three different regimes. A regime that is called dilute, where the mucin molecules are not interacting with each other, they're like monads, so they don't talk to each other. And they really act biophysically as just a solution of proteins. Then we have this very critical concentration that because it's so critical, it got a special name. So it's called C star, concentration star. And that is a concentration where mucin start to touch 
and interact with each other. At that concentration, mucus starts acting as a gel-like substance. After C star, so at a concentration of mucin that are higher than C star, we enter in the semi-dilute or more clearly interpenetrating regime, which is where mucus acts like a proper gel-like material. So in this graph here, we have the changes in viscosity um, as mucin concentration goes up. And uh, the green line depicts uh, the behavior of normal mucus that is composed by very large multimeric uh, polymeric mucins. mucins, mucins. So at, um, this is C star, so this is a fam famous overlap concentration. And below C star, the viscosity of mucus increases linearly with the concentration of mucin. So in this phase, mucus is, acts like just a regular solution of, um, of proteins. It doesn't, it doesn't have gel-like properties. Above C stars, mucus viscosity starts increasing to the third power of mucin concentration. At this point, mucus starts becoming a gel. And this is not necessarily, it's important to understand, it's not necessarily linked to any pathology. Mucus needs to be gel-like to uh, absorb its biological function. The problem is that when you get too high in mucin concentration, pathology starts to ensue because uh, the mucins are interpenetrating and locking into each other and creating too much viscous material that cannot be easily moved or penetrated by, uh, by treatment. So again, I said the green line was the behavior of mucus if it's made up by long uh, mucin polymers. And this is what happens if we chop the mucin in smaller um, mucin uh, molecules. So this is what happens down here. So you, it's pretty intuitive to understand that C star for a shorter mu mucin would occur at a higher concentration. So the different uh, balls are gonna start to touch each other when they are at a higher concentration. This is great news because when you are here in the regime where there is you know, pathological concentration of mucin, if you cut them, you're going to have viscosities that are much lower. And so your chances of clearing the mucus are going to be higher. However, uh, this, is the, this is the rationale uh, uh, for cutting mucus with mucolytics. However, we don't really know what happens in this phase of the curve. When normal mucus, which is probably in areas of the lungs that are not affected by disease, gets chopped up, would that mucus still work? We don't know. Thus, we need a model. So to understand how to build this model um, rationally, we need to understand how mucin becomes so big. So the journey of a mucin, and this is the biosynthetic pathway of MAC5B, which is the main macromolecular component of air, airway mucus, uh, begins in the ER, like any other protein. Uh, monomers are um, translated, and in the ER, they start dimerizing through their C terminus. Then they proceed to the Golgi network, where two things happen. The first thing is that they keep being uh, elongated, they keep multimerizing, and this time, the only domain that they have available and free is the N-terminal domain. So there is multimerization through the N-terminal domain. And all these multimerization are mediated by formation of disulfide bonds. The other thing that happens in the Golgi, they get heavily glycosylated, and once the whole process is finished, they're ready to be packed, put in uh, uh, secretory granules, and either stored inside the cells or secreted. So the um, um, intuitive approach to cut the mucin and see what happens would be to just to throw a reducing agent on them and cut them. However, this approach has two main drawbacks. Um, problematic because the reducing agents that we have currently available are not specific, so they can cut the disulfide bonds that are between uh, those N and, and C terminal domain. However, they can also cut intramolecular disulfide bonds that are responsible for shielding hydrophobic domain, that are responsible for folding, you name it, can, you know, big mayhem can uh, ensue. The other thing is that if you think about doing this approach in vivo, 
you're going to reduce all sorts of other things. And you probably don't want to do that. So we design an alternative approach, which um, requires mutating the two cysteine that are responsible for NN multimerization in the Golgi. And using this approach, we design um, a mouse model where uh, the mucin that can be secreted are either wild type, so long and high molecular weight poly polymers. They are a little bit shorter because every time a hetero a mutant dimer is incorporated in the chain, it caps the chain, and so those mucins are supposed to become, come out shorter. And then in the homozygous knocking mouse, we're just going to have dimeric mice, where the C to C disulfide bond is preserved, but there is no further elongation of the chain through the end, uh, terminal multimerization. So at this point, these mice got their, this line, got their colloquial name. We call them dimer mice because of the knockings. So these heterozygous mice for this mutation are fertile. We bred them and we characterize the progeny. Mice are born in the expected Mendelian proportions and that we observe no mortality before weaning. However, after weaning, we see sporadic but consistent mortality of both the heterozygous and the knock-in mice. So mice that make shorter mucins die and mice that make very short mucins die. So we verified by Agarose Western blot that actually the predicted size of the mucins that these mice were secreted, secreting were actually the ones that, that we hypothesized. And uh, you can see here, this is an Agarose Western blot, uh, BAL sample, bronchovirus lavage samples, are run in both uh, unreduced and reduced conditions. So if you look at the, and they're run side by side from three mice for each genotype, um, if we look at the unreduced sample, it's pretty obvious that the wild type mice are characterized by the regular high molecular weight polymers. In the heads, the, there is a shift towards reduced um, molecular sizes. And uh, it's interesting to note that they, these mice only make up to octamers. There is nothing above them. And our dimer mice are actually dimer mice. They only make very short mucins. All of them, however, when we reduce them in vitro with DTT, the they're all made up by the same monomer, which, which was reassuring. The other thing that we noticed because of this, uh, we quantified this, this Western rot, and we noted that the pterozygous and the leukine mice seem to have a little bit more 5B in their bronchoviral lavage. And we're going to you know, circle back on this observation later. Hmm. So. <laughs> When we look at the uh, phenotype of these mice, so Barb Grab performed a series of experiments to measure mucociliary clearance in the intact nasopharynx. And as you can see here, there was a marked reduction in MCC in both the heterozygous and the knock-in. This observation correlated with the histological evidence of nasopharyngeal plugs. So these plugs are composed by mucus, hair, particle, bedding, uh, food that gets stuck into the nasopharynx. These mice cannot clear it and just gets stuck there and accumulates with, uh, with age. We think that this plug is responsible for the death, the occasional death of the head and the knock-in mice. Uh, mice are obligate nose uh, breathers, so if they have a big thing in their, in their nose, eventually they <clears throat> might die. Going down the respiratory tract, uh, we phenotype also the lower airways. So Barb did uh, mucociliary clearance measurement in the trachea. And in this case, she is measuring uh, the amount of particles that can be removed after inhalation. And you can see here that both the heads and the knock-ins uh, cannot fully remove all the particles that are inhaled. Going further down in the int intrapulmonary airways, we observe sporadic but pretty consistent little mucus plugs in the lungs of the knock-in mice. In, again, suggesting that these mice have problems in cleaning it in all levels of the respiratory tree. So a, a big breakthrough in this experiment was um, brought upon by, the, by our ability of, to culture and expand the mouse tracheal epithelial cells. And we did that using a modified um, protocol based on the conditionally programmed cell cultures. Um, so this 
uh, method allowed us to culture these tri mouse tracheal epithelial cells. And we noticed that the phenotype, the polymerization phenotype that we observed in vivo was preserved in vitro. And once you have an in vitro model, you can do everything you want. You can <laughs> explore you know, different challenges, uh, and that's what we did. Um, we, we treated these cultures with IL-1 beta. We see an upregulation of mucin. They, they don't seem to change significantly their polymerization status, but at that point, you can have co-induction um, of MACFIB and 5AC, which we only see when we stimulate the cells, the cells with, uh, with IL-1 beta. The other things that we did with these MTEC cells, um, Jerome Carpenter purified the secretions, and you can do atomic force microscope, microscopy to observe the, the, the strands of mucins. And it's pretty obvious here that the wild type have long strands of MACFIB, and uh, the knock-in have these little stubby uh, strands. Of course, we wanted to measure some relevant biophysical properties of this uh, mucus secretion. And uh, as uh, hypothesized using our C-star model, uh, we did observe a reduced viscosity for the mucins that were shorter. Brian Button went ahead and he measured adhesion uh, strength in these secretions. And in this case, only the knock-in mice were significantly different from wild type. So we're finding out different phenotypes that are not always uh, the same. Um, this MTEC culture was also very helpful for us to do pulse and chase experiments combined with immunoprecipitation to measure the rate of secretion for 5B. So if you, um, we, these experiments were done with wild type and knock-in cultures. And you can see that after 24 hours of incubation, after giving them 35S uh, cysteine, uh, the MACFIB knock-in secreted more MACFIB in the media, in the apical media, which correlates with the results that we had in our original BAL Western blot. Um, the interesting observation is that this, this observation was repeated, so a baseline Dimeric MACFIB are secreted at a higher speed than wild type. However, if you wash the surface of the cells and then stimulate granule secretion with ATP gamma S, the wild type have these granules and so they secrete extra mucins. But the dimer, they don't quite match the wild the performance of the wild type. So they don't, probably the, the mucin dimer don't get stored as much as the wild type in the, inside the cells. And finally, our last little bit of show, we, we Brian Button, <laughs> has a very cool setup in his lab. So he has this system where he uses um, primary human epithelial cells to establish these racetracks. It's very much similar to the old method of using frog palate and then put secretions on it and see how they, they race. Um, so, but he can do that on this super cool microscope that has the stage that rotates so he can test whether secretions are um, able to support transport uh, against gravity or uh, in, uh, in the horizontal mode. So what we found is that when we tested wild type and nokin secretions, they seem to have similar ability to transport in the horizontal mode. However, when you put them against gravity, wild type can still creep up and, and transport against gravity, while the knock-in secretion totally fail and they draw backwards. And so in conclusion, uh, we think we have a super cool model to uh, study the effect of mul mucin multimerization on the function of mucus. Um, we were very excited that this model has fairly strong phenotypes, both in vivo and in vitro. And of course, our, you know, the, the finding that the longer, larger multimers are required to transport against gravity um, are pretty significant because they give us, you know, a rationale for why are they that long and they are preserved to be that long by evolution. Uh, and of course, we are planning to do all sorts of stuff with these mice. Challenge them, uh, um, taking them apart in every which way. <laughs>
So thank you for your, for your attention. <laughs> if you have questions. OK, any questions? Yes, sir. So the effect of airway surface hydration. We are trying to get into airway surface hydration would change the concentration of mucins, right? So we're trying to get at that question with an in vivo model that has airway surface dehydration, our beta inactrogenic mouse. We're crossing that mouse with this mouse, and we're going to see what happens. The thing is that, in reality, we don't know where C star is for a mouse. And so that, that cross can give us an idea. If it gets better, it means that we are, that C star is a little, it's moved to the right, and so indeed we can clear better mucus, even when it's hyper-concentrated. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, and that's something that I skipped. I had a reference on that on my little notes. <laughs> yes, so the, the nasopharyngeal plug is, you know, a prototypical phenotype of those mice. Um, in our hands, the MAC5B knockouts never got the pneumonia that was originally described by Chris Evans, um, but they do die sporadically. And when we can catch them, in time, we do see aspiration of that big. Oh yeah, they're, they're all in the same. They're all in the same facility. Yes, they don't seem to be very different. You know, as far as you know, lung inflammation, they also don't have a, you know a, um, any really amazing cell counts and differentials. They're, they're pretty normal. But again, um, if you take the moribund ones, then they can be very sick. Yes, ma'am. Carla. I'm from UNC. I'm from the Institute. It's a lab meeting. Yeah, so I, I am, as you know, I'm not an expert on intracellular um, mucus storage and, and trafficking, but I did talk to Ana Maria Aramillo. Um, and, yes, yes. And so she also, I mean, she, it would be hard to assign a certain granule to a certain mucins, but yeah, she agreed that, you know, probably these shorter mucins, they just go through the constitutive pathway and they just keep whatever is the targeting mechanism to say, okay, you mucin, go there and stay there until, stay put until I need to secrete you. Um, but, but I know Juan is working on, on characterizing that um, aspect better. Yes. Yes, great. So this is part of one of our million challenges that we're going to put these mice through. Because in naive mice, 
MAC5B is really the only mucin that you find in naive, healthy mice unchallenged. That's the only mucin that you find in the lung. However, we are also wondering how would this mini mucin interact with, in conditions where we have stimulation of MAC5AC um, secretion, such as house dust mice challenge, IL-13 challenge, and so on and so forth. So I don't know. N next CF conference. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes, you can you can start walking, Livia. You're good. So, um, to bring us across the finish line, um, we have future doctor Livia Del Piano, I think, and uh, she's going to be talking about dynamic regulation of ASL, pH by TMIM 16 a in the nasal epithelial, derived from CF donors with rare class one mutations. Thank you. Uh, okay. Do you want to use that one? Yeah, I'll use this one. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to first thank the organizer uh, to invite me to present my work. Uh, I'm Livia Del Piano, a PhD student at Newcastle University. Um, and today I will present you my work on the regulation of the ASLPH by TMM16A in nasal epithelial cells with uh, very class 1 mutations. So uh, I don't have anything to disclose. So the uh, um, the air surface, uh, the <laughs> air surface liquid is a thin liquid layer covering, covering the airways. In uh, normal airways, it's regulated by CFTR, by secretion of chloride and bicarbonates through CFTR. Um, in CF, uh, the lack of CFTR um, induces uh, an ASL uh, acidification, and uh, the. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> this is an ASL, uh, ASL pH acidification that, um, and, and mucus stasis. So restoring the ASL pH should improve the ASL hydration, the mucus recurrence, and reduce the microbial infections. Um, there are uh, different targets that can be used uh, instead of CFTR to improve the ASL pH, and those are ATP12A, uh, SSC26A9, or um, TMM16A, and SSC26A4, for example. Um, in my work, uh, I decided to study the activity of TMM16A, that is a calcium activated chloride in bicarbonate channel, and SSC26A4. This is a uh, chloride and bicarbonate and an ion exchanger, um, and uh, I wanted to uh, investigate if those two channels could uh, improve the ASLPH under normal and inflammatory conditions, and uh, I also tried to identify compounds that can modulate their activity, and they can be used uh, for future CF therapies. So. To, uh, we first uh, isolated cells from CF donors with three different class 1 mutations. Um, those cells were expanded, and few of them were, um, few of them were team M16A and SSC26A4 were knocked out with, uh, using CRISPR-Cas. The cells were then differentiated under ALI condition, and I studied a ASL pH, staining the ASL with a pH-sensitive dye, and the pH were measured in real time using a play reader. I also studied the um, uh, epithelia, trans the transepithelia ion transport using a sink chamber. So during the experiment, the baseline ASL pH was measured over two hours. Um, then I stimulated cells using a calcium agonist, this is carbacol, um, followed by a cyclic MP agonist, and I used forskolin. And I performed this experiment under normal condition and under inflammatory condition. Um, what I found out is, was that in inflammatory condition, the baseline ASLPH was significantly more, um, more acidic in inflammatory condition. The addition of carbacol um, transiently uh, alkalinized the ASLPH, um, but then 
uh, to end up in a normal baseline condition. But more surprising, uh, it was that uh, the addition of phosgolene in uh, interleukin-4 condition induced a significant market alkalinization, something that we were not expecting in rare class 1 mutations. So I first started studying uh, TMM16A knockout cells, and what I found out was there was no significant difference in baseline ASLPH under normal condition between control cells and TMM16A knockout cells. Um, but when I treated the cells with interleukin-4, I found out that team M16A knockout cells, the baselines in team M16A knockout cells, was significantly more alkaline compared to um, interleukin-4 uh, treated cells, uh, interleukin-4 control treated cells. Um, the addition of carbacol had an effect only in interleukin-4 condition uh, in, in parental cells, but not in team M16A knockout cells. Um, and then the final addition of phosgolene had no effect in tmm 6 a knockout cells. So then um, I wanted to um, investigate this carbacol response, and in short circuit current study, uh, carbacol had no effect on the normal condition. Uh, but uh, under inflammatory condition, I found a small um, carbacol-induced short circuit current uh, in interleukin-4 treated cells, interleukin-4 control treated cells, showing that uh, it was tmm 16 a dependent. Then I wanted to use another ca uh, calcium agonist. I decided to study CPA. It is a circuit pump inhibitor. So there's a... Um, this is uh, increased the cytosolic calcium concentration. And what I found out was that in interleukin-4 treated cells, the, uh, there was um, significant alkalinization of the ASLPH after addition of CPA. Um, but when I tested in uh, CPA in team 16A knockout cells, this alkalinization was, um, was not present. So, I tested CPA also in short circuit current, and under normal condition, CPA did not induce any um, short circuit current. And in inflammatory, for, uh, inflammatory condition, CPA was able to uh, increase um, chloride secretion only in parental cells, not in TMM16A knockout cells, showing that it was uh, TMM16A dependent. Um, then I wanted to um, try to investigate more um, the activity of tmm 16 a using a tmm 16 a modulator, and I decided to use uh, EACT that has been described as a specific tmm 16 a activator. Um, however, it has been already published that it has um, some off-target effect. Um, so when I added EAC on, uh, on my C, uh, CF epithelia, I found that there was a significant uh, alkalinization in both normal and inflammatory condition. Um, more surprisingly, um, this alkalinization was also present in team M16A knockout cells. Um, so I wanted to look at this uh, unexpected, unexpected response, and I used it again, uh, short circuit short-circuit current studies. Um, in this case, I measure the uh, transepithelia resistance, and what I found out was that af soon after the addition of a EAC, the transepithelia resist resistance was dramatically reduced in, in all conditions tested. Um, so I tested uh, if the EAC could have an off-target effect on tight junction, and uh, I tested the fluorescein uh, assay. So permeability uh, the in uh, uh, both CF and TMM16A knockout epithelia, the epithelia were getting leaky as uh, when after the addition of EAC. So um, going back on my first experiment, um, and I wanted to see why uh, I found this phosgolene induced alkalinization in CF uh, with class one mutation, and I tested phosgolene in short current, and not, um, it, the phosgolene wasn't able to induce any uh, short circuit curve in both in the interleukin-4 and normal condition. So I tried to uh, think which other uh, channel could be involved, and my first, uh, what my first idea was to look at SSC26A4. 
So we made uh, SACI 26A4 knockout cells and they performed the same set of experiments. So in SACI 26A4 knockout cells, the baseline pH was unaffected under normal condition. But when <laughs> interleukin-4 was added in uh, Interleukin-4, SSC 26A4 knockout cells with interleukin-4, the baseline pH was significantly lower compared to uh, um, CF cells. Then uh, carbacolet no effect in any condition tested, and the full screen response in this case was uh, significantly reduced in SSC 26A4 knockout cells. So showing that uh, those cells have uh, F, um, SSC 26A4 um, cyclic MP um, alkalization through SSC 26A4. Um, so then I'd, we tried to look for some um, compounds working through this channel, and I decided to study um, a prostaglandin compound uh, that is used in clinic. Um, and when I added to the cells, this compound did not uh, it induced uh, an isl pH alkalinization in CF cells, but this alkalinization wasn't present in SSC26A4. And I also found that a beta-2 agonist um, was able to, uh, to have the same effect. Um, interestingly, we found that those two compounds uh, were also able to induce uh, fluid secretion in our organoids in, uh, in a different uh, class one mutation. So, um, to conclude, uh, I found is that CFP epithelia with class one mutation treated with interleukin 4 have a more acidic ASL pH that will, uh, will alkalinize following calcium and cyclopen P stimuli. The TM16A has an indirect role in regulating baseline ASLPH, but only under interleukin 4 condition, and has a direct role in the ASLPH regulation in uh, sustained increase of cytosolic calcium. Uh, SSC 26A4 regulates the baseline ASLPH, and the ASLPH responds to cyclic MP agonists, but only under interleukin 4 condition. Um, so at the end, we can conclude the, uh, oh, the cyclic MP agonist also induced fluid secretion in our organoids. Um, so we can conclude that targeting team M16A or SSA26A4 are still promising mutation independent therapy for CF. So I want to thank all the people involved in this work, especially my supervisor, Dr. Mike Gray, um, the CF Trust, and you all for the attention. <laughs> Okay, any questions? Delph. Yeah. Yeah, team M sixteen A is overexpressed uh, when there's uh, IL four. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, have a sustained increase in calcium is not physiological and is not recommended. Um, uh, so I, I suppose there would be plenty of side effects and plenty of other channels could be activated. Um, so the reason to use it, it was to identify if steam and could be activated. So we know that it would be activated if um, there's an increase in calcium. So it was a starting point um, and then Probably a more fine tuning of calcium uh, release would be would be required. Yes, ma'am. Um, it, de it depends by uh, in the donors, uh, but it was between eighty to ninety five percent. I have a quick question, um, just because it relates to my personal stuff that I do for a living. Um, so what was what was y'all's thought in picking IL-4 as kind of your stimulation? Um, 
um, because we wanted to increase the um, the expression of the of the mm -hmm. two channels. Oh, and I guess what I meant was is that IL four is more of is often more of a um, TH two eosinophil recruiter, and in CF we think that. There's a lot of studies that show that things like IL-8 and things that are more of a neutrophil attractant to the um, various bacteria and things are in the mucus. So I was wondering if, if you tried something more down that pathway, would you actually get even a more robust response from this because you're actually stimulating through that cytokine pathway as opposed to more of the TH2? Um, okay, well, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> well, you don't have to have an answer. I just, it was more of a comment. Uh, so. I, 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 did, I didn't try um, other cytokines. I yeah. uh, just stick with the interleukin-4 because it's well described in literature. Yeah, no, no. Uh, I the, um, and, like, my point was, was just to boost the uh, yeah. expression of the two channels. Um, but, yeah, probably it could be an uh, yeah. interesting thing to do. Yeah. Having it around in the lab and available is a good reason to do it. So <laughs> I was just... And like that is very uh, cost effective, uh, but I was just saying that you, that's a lot of what I look at is actually IL-4 stimulation and CF and asthma and things. So, you know, you see that, um, but those big IL-8 responses and things um, are a lot of what we see. So you may, that might be an interesting thing yeah, to look definitely. at. Yeah, definitely. Any other questions? We have technically 20 minutes. So. Yeah, five thirty. So, yeah, so nobody, we, we the doors are locked until five thirty. So just so you're aware. So. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, okay, so I was watching the UPT before before adding the um, um, before staining them because I didn't want um, any mucus interaction. It was it wasn't uh, the reason why I was starting it. Um, I think that having mucus will uh, would create uh, some kind of buffering or uh, like or even create a more hypo hypoxic situation. Um, since I was studying, like in real time, in thin film, uh, having a thick layer of mucus would would, uh, would it be good for my staining. Um, but yeah. yes, sir. Yeah, so I haven't studied the ASL height, uh, but the the whole idea is to restore pH and then consequently have an increase in um, ASL hydration. Um, so, yeah. yeah, just the pH. Um, because I was using a plate reader and not a microscope. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. I did not help you. Um, so that concludes this workshop. I personally want to give credit to Nam Sue because this was all his brainstorming and things. Yes, it was. He made the figure and everything, so this is a wonderful session. This is all thanks to him. So, yeah. yeah.